Hello everyone. How are we doing? So I thought I'd give you, I got really good feedback from uh, the last book review that we did on the 4-Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. I thought I'd do another one. So I'm here chilling, got my halo light, and I've got the future. Purple quality street latte. Christmas blend. Woohoo! So the book, I'll put a link and an image somewhere on the on the video. The link is the um, the science of storytelling by Will Starr. Fantastic book. I came across this book because, as we'll get into when I read when I read some excerpts from the book, um, Darren Brown, funnily enough watching some of his stage shows and he talks a lot about stories. Human beings. Oh, hello, Olga. Hello. Hello, darling. Human beings. The reason why we evolved to where we are now, you could argue, especially if you read um, Sapiens and Homo Deus and other books like that, because the power of stories and the power to be able to transfer information through stories from one tribe to another to where we are now obviously now from the printing press to now social media youtube podcasts an amazing way to tell stories and i've always been interested in this but there's a science behind it as well the science and our psychology behind the stories we tell ourselves from such an early age information comes in we filter that information through our different frame of reference through our families friends all the influences and events that have happened to us in life they're the filters that we frame these events through that builds up a picture and that makes a story of our model of the world and our perception of reality so I'm just going to work through the book. I highlighted a lot of um, information on my Kindle. So I'm just going to highlight and work through some of the, the bits that I found interesting. I definitely recommend that you get the book. I'm just giving you a little snippet of some of the stuff that I got from it. So let's get into it. So we're going to start with something that's quite a little bit depressing, the thought of death. But like Stoics and Stoicism, if we contemplate the fact that we are a finite resource. One day we are going to die. And we can accept the fact. And we can concentrate on living, living our best life. So the start of the book actually talks about the, the end. You are going to die and so will everyone you love. And then there will be the heat death. All the change in the universe will cease. The stars will die. There'll be nothing left of anything but infinite, dead, freezing void. Happy Monday. Human life in all its noise and hubris will be rendered meaningless for eternity. But that's not how we live our lives. Humans might be in the unique possession of the knowledge that our existence is essentially meaningless. But we carry on as if in ignorance of it. We beetle away happily into our minishares hours and days with the fact of the void hovering over us to look directly into it and respond with an entirely rational descent into despair is to be diagnosed with a mental health condition categorized as somehow falter the cure for the horror is story our brains distract us from this terrible truth by filling our lives with hopeful goals and encourage us, encouraging us to strive for them what we want and the ups and downs of our struggle to get it is a story of us all. It gives our existence the illusion of meaning and turns our gaze from the dread. There's simply no way to understand the human world without stories. They fill our newspapers, our law courts, our sporting arenas, our government debating chambers, our school playgrounds, our computer games, the lyric to our songs, our private thoughts and public conversations and our waking and sleeping dreams. Stories are everywhere. Stories 
are us. So that's what I meant at the beginning when I said that, like, even from birth, you're taking this information in. The moment you start to understand that you've got an ego, you can you can identify yourself in a mirror. You have a sense of who you are. You tell yourself stories. And then all the way through school and colleges, you tell yourself a story about who you are, depending on what clothes you were, whether you played sports. Are you a sporty guy? Are you academic? Or I'm the artist. I'm the mathematician. And then the stories about the job you're going to do when you get older. The story that if you don't do well in your exams or you, it's going to affect the rest of your life. Our stories and the stories that we build up about our model of the world carry on and go on to affect every aspect of our life. So back to the book. We experience our day-to-day -day lives in story mode. The brain creates a world for us to live in and populates it with allies and villains. Shortly in the book, there's a cracking passage around the fact that our brain creates our reality. But our brain never experiences the actual reality because it's encased in our heads inside our skull. We experience the world through our senses, visual, auditory, gustatory and olfactory. All our senses and kinesthetic, all our senses give us the details to build up the picture and the story of our world, but the brain never actually experiences. It turns the chaos and bleakness of reality into a simple, hopeful tale. And at the centre, it places its star. We are the centre of our own universes. You must think when you talk to yourself, when you have conversations with yourself, or there's an event that happens, something happens in your life, everything revolves around you, don't it? I don't mean you, as in you watching, I mean me, us, the individual. An event revolves, we are always the centre of our own attention, aren't we? Story is what brain does. It's a story processor, not a logic processor. Story emerges from human minds as naturally as breath emerges, emerges from between human lips. You don't have to be a genius to master it, you're already doing it. Becoming better at telling stories is simply a matter of peering inwards at the mind itself and asking how it does it. Our brain is a story processor, not a logic processor. I'm going through a bit of a phase at the moment because I'm trying to um, sell a new a new idea and a new a new concept about writing copy, so writing business and sales copy. And one of the big things that I've I've come across recently is that, and it alludes to this a little bit, is that people buy through emotion and justify by logic. So, for example, there's a there's a jacket that. Um, I'm kind of hoping I'm going to get for my 40th birthday, but you never know. Um, by the company Through Dark, a high-end outdoor outdoor company. The jacket's quite expensive, but the emotional side of it, I need that jacket. You can, maybe subconsciously, but there's something pulling me into buying that jacket that um, maybe it's going to elevate my status. Maybe it's going to put me in that, I buy into that brand. The emotional side of it oh yeah special forces um, they use it you buy with emotion it'll suit me it'll look good on me there the external what am i trying to say basically external events motivated by external events for buying this jacket emotionally but then I'm going to justify it by logic. So I'm going to justify it by if I spend if the jacket cost if the jacket costs five hundred quid, say for example, 
I know I'm going to have that jacket for five years. That's £100 a year. That's not much to spend on a jacket. You buy a coat now for 100 quid, And if it lasts you a year, yeah, fair enough, it lasts me a year. So I'm going to buy with emotion, but justify by logic. It's quite interesting that I'm also looking at like the language that we use. I'm trying to write kind of persuasive language in the sales copy and they're using using stuff that's called in, in neuro-linguistic programming if any of you have you have come across that before um linguistic presuppositions yeah it's a mouthful i get it um but i've just started reading up on them and it's really interesting that your model of the world so the stories that you tell yourselves will have what they call some modalities and presuppositions for example a very basic example will be that i'm a kinesthetic learner um oh that's a story i've told myself i'm a kinesthetic learner so i use the language of how can you handle stress how can you get a grip on your anxiety see what i mean i'm using language and linguistics that some modalities that appeal to my learning learning style so you can listen to if you pick up on the way people use these kind of adjectives and nouns you can kind of start to understand their model of the world it's really interesting like this linguistic presuppositions that i've been working on at the moment is a presupposition is if you read a sentence you've got to automatically believe something is true in that sentence for it to make sense so i used one earlier that um how aware are you of how you reacted in the recent covid epidemic so to read that sentence are you aware of how you reacted so you did react are you aware of how your reaction affected your happiness so you have to believe that it affected your happiness for that sentence to make sense am i making sense yeah I'm still trying to get my head around it i'm still trying to figure it out so i get it it's it's difficult but it's really interesting i mean you can obviously use it the a negative way and look to manipulate people and stuff but in terms of promoting sales copper and getting people invested and getting them essentially to buy your products it's really interesting and looking at loads of examples and it appears everywhere appealing to different people's learning style i mean that's probably what convinced me to buy this um hazelnut latte based on the flavor of the purple chocolate in uh, quality street so we build up these stories the archetypical archetypal however you want to say it story that the book refers to is about star wars the hero's journey some examples such as the campbell inspired that's joseph campbell by the way inspired star wars a new hope are wonderful but too many are more Mars Bars stories, cold corporate and seemingly cooked up by committer. For me, the problem with the traditional approach is that it's led to a preoccupation with these structural recipes. It's easy to see why this has happened. Often the search has been for the one true story, the ultimate perfect plot structure by which every take can be judged. How are you going to describe that if not by dissecting it into its various movements? So later on in the book, he, he flits between talking about our stories, the psychology behind why we tell each other stories, and relates it to film and actually how to make, how to structure a film or a, or a TV show with the various plots and the five acts. Really interesting. It's something that I didn't really know about before, that a film is broken up into various different acts. And each film more often than not, follows these same five act structures. So most movies turn out to be just variations on the standard five act plot, which is successful not because of some secret cosmic truth or any universal law of storytelling, but because it's the neatest way of showing deep character change. It's simple, efficient and relentless. This is why I believe the focus on plot 
should be shifted onto character. So you know all the best films, generally speaking, are all based on character, aren't they? So the, the hero's journey, for example, if we're talking about Star Wars, in the in the book, Will Starr talks about um, Luke Skywalker and his journey through the peaks and troughs, through finding out what his true purpose is, then having a dip and a fall, then rising up to ultimately defeat um, Darth Vader. Seeing it through that five-act plot is really interesting. And that's what we do with our, our own life story. That's how we buy into things. We relate to that hero's journey. Back to the book. The sacred flaw approach is a character first process, an attempt to create a story that mimics the various ways a brain creates a life and which therefore feels true and fresh and comes preloaded with potential drama. Sacred flaw, we all have flaws and the flaws are what make us human. And the flaws are what make us relatable to other people. I have flaws, I have insecurities. I see those flaws in other people. But generally speaking, I get on with other people who have the same flaws as me. Back to the book. This is how it works. You walk into a room. Your brain predicts that the scene should look and sound and feel like. Then it generates an hallucination based on these predictions. It's this hallucination that you experience as the world around you. That's what I was saying before. It's this hallucination you exist at the centre of every minute of every day. You never experience actual reality because you have no direct access to it. Consider the whole beautiful world around you with all its colours and sounds and smells and textures. Your brain is not directly experiencing any of that. It's a crazy thing to think about. We build our whole perception of reality on our experiences. And we're so adamant a lot of the times that we are right. We are writing what we're saying. Our argument, our point of view is the right point of view, is the best one. But we only come to that realisation through the information that is inputted that we've consumed through our various senses, like I spoke about before. But it's that information that has created our version of reality, our map of the territory, our perception of reality, our version of events. It's just a story, it's created. But our brain never experiences our brain is not directly experiencing any of that. I really like um, when he talks about, talks about in the book. Um, again, it comes across in sales copy, but when you're reading a story and how to create language that really, really draws a reader in. Instead of telling us a thing was terrible, describe it so that we will be terrified. Don't say things are delightful. Make us say delightful when we read the description. So it's like when we're reading things, and I'm, I'm guilty of this whenever I've tried to write copy or write an email or write a blog, writing it and saying, I felt terrified or whatever, instead of writing it, describing it, so the reader will feel the emotion that I'm trying to describe instead of just putting the one word, the adjective. Again, it, it should, it should, the word description comes to mind. Do not say the word that you want to use. Use a description to describe the word, if that makes sense. And I'm, I'm to and I'm throwing here. I'm not, I'm going off the notes that made on Kindle. So they might be all over the place, but I got it, I just recommend that you read the book. It had such a an effect on me that I have gifted it and recommended it to a few people. 
Um, so back to the book, page 51. Cause and effect is a fundamental of how we understand the world. Cause and effect. You've seen an example of this when we started COVID. No one knew how we ended up in the epidemic with the epidemic that we had and was still involved in. So everyone was conspiracy theories. Betty next door became um, an epidemiology expert. Bob who lives down the streets became um, a, bio, a biomechanical engineer who knew where it come from in China. Everyone became their own expert. And it's because of this cause and effect. It's fundamental in how we understand the world. We don't like things in isolation. Our brain needs a narrative. It needs to create a narrative. This means this. This happened because of this cause and effect. We can't handle incidents in isolation that don't make sense. Our brain just can't compute that. And I imagine that at some point, a million years ago, that would have been a um, a survival mechanism that helped us survive as long as we needed to. We needed to make sense and create stories, whether that's a way of passing on information, whether that's a way of um, basically justifying why things happen. Back to the book. Having undergone its adolescent narrative making process, the brain has essentially worked out who we are, what matters and how we should behave in order to get what we want. Since birth, it's been in a state of heightened plasticity that has enabled it to build its models. But now it becomes less plastic and harder to change. Most of the peculiarities and mistakes that make us who we are have been incorporated into its models. Our flaws and our peculiarities have been, have become who we are. Our minds have been made up. This is a crazy thing. So on some of the um, recent webinars that I did um, on the Off The Mat series, I described a model that it describes in the book and I'm just paraphrasing and I put it into my own words. From very early on in our development, so from very young age to around the age of 20, the information that comes in, like Will Storrs described here, our brain is in a heightened state of plasticity that has enabled it to build its models. So information comes in and it builds the models for who we judge ourselves to be, our identity off these models. Information comes in, events happen, influences, influences, we create up a model of our world. Any events that happen shape our identity. Plasticity is the key word. Malleable shapes our reality, our identity, our ego. Past a certain age, and it's roughly around 18, 20 years of age. And this is a beautiful turn of phrase here. Our flaws and peculiarities have become who we are. Our minds have been made up. Our minds have made up. Once we reach that certain age, our minds have been made up. Literally have been made up. Not made up. I've made a decision. My mind's made up. We have. Our minds have been made up. That is now how we see the world. And what really happens, and I want you to try and get your head around this. What really happens is an event happens. That event does not change us. We make that event fit our model of the world. I'll repeat that again. So an event, we've gone past, past the plasticity phase. So the event does not change and build on our existing idea of identity about ourselves. An event happens through all the filters and our submodalities and our filters and all that kind of stuff. It makes, we make reality fit 
what happened. So something happens, we make it fit our model of the world. It doesn't add to our model of the world. And that's crazy that, and you wonder why we have so much conflict. And for me, I mean, from the stuff that I've read and I've spoke about and I've had the opportunity to speak to a few people regarding their points of view, and they kind of all come to the same conclusion that one of the easiest ways to either build rapport or to avoid conflict is to simply try and understand somebody else's model of the world. We come from a place where if I'm in a conversation with someone or a debate or I come at it just from the way we've been brought up, the way we are as humans, I come at it from my point of view. Yeah, I want to defend my point of view. But if we come at it from, I want to try and understand where you're coming from first. Understand before being understood. We can avoid a lot of conflict. And don't get me wrong, I'm not talking at you. I'm working this out. I love how Jordan Peterson, a clinical psychologist, I love listening to his lectures because in his lectures, he... He gives a lecture, but he's almost working it out himself as well in his head. Don't get me wrong, I don't understand half of the stuff that comes out of his head, but it, it's hard. That's why I like watching it, because it makes me brain hurt. I can feel I'm getting a little bit, a little bit cleverer from just watching his, um, his lectures or listening to his podcasts. But I still don't understand what he's going on about. So I think the last one I watched, he was, he was, he was showing you how the Lion King had archetypal um, myths around what Carl Jung used as his philosopher. He was relating Carl Jung's philosopher through the story and archetype of the Lion King. <laughs> yeah. So as I'm talking to you now, I'm kind of doing a similar thing. No, I'm not um, trying to explain Lion King and how it involves some deep, deep philosopher. No, I'm trying to work things out myself as I'm talking to you now. I'm trying to work out how I, how that fits my model of the world and trying to talk things through, explain things a little bit more so we can come to the same conclusions. So back to the book. Once the brain's internal structures are established, they turn the relationship between the internal and the external around. Instead of the internal structures being shaped by the environment, the individual now acts to preserve established structures in the face of environmental challenges. That's essentially a clever way of saying what I've just said about how. If an event happens, past a certain point, an event happens, we made that event fit our model of the world but they just put it in a much nicer way. The individual now acts to preserve established structures. So the established structures that are already modeled in your head, it acts to preserve those structures. So I make that event fit my preserved structures. It finds, the brain finds changes in structure difficult and painful. So anytime we try to change our story, our brain will push back. Our identity will push back. It is a defense mechanism to push back against anything that's going to try and change and maybe question our story. That's quite powerful, isn't it? So we respond to such challenges with distorted thinking, arguments and aggression. We ignore, forget or attempt to actively discredit information that is inconsistent with these structures. In NLP, Again, in the linguistics um, stuff that I was talking about before, what happens is when we receive information and we put it through our filters, the filters are all the stuff that happened to us during life and where we lived, where we got brought up, our parents' influences, all that kind of stuff. We put it through the filters and then to make the model, to make the experience fit our model of the world, we delete so this is what we do with our language. We delete, we distort, and we generalise. 
a lot of the times. This is known as the Milton model, I think. Um, meta programs and mental, Milton models of linguistics. So if I remember, say something happens to me, um, and I have an argument with someone, say I'm in conflict with someone, um, and obviously this is my version of events, yeah? So I have an argument with someone, and then I tell about I tell someone about what's just happened. Because this is all done through my own perception, so we had the argument, the event happened, it goes through my filter system, and then I make that event fit my model of the world. So when I tell someone else the language that I'm going to use some of it's going to be deleted because I'm going to emit information that has made it fit my model of the world, my perception of reality of what happened. I might generalise. So I might say everyone when there might have only been like one or two people there. So everybody saw it. Everybody saw his car go into the back of mine. Well, maybe it wasn't everyone. Maybe it was just one or two people who stood there. But I've generalised it to make it fit my model of the world. Um... You have conflict with someone, yeah, everyone was talking about me. Everybody was talking about that's another generalisation. We delete and we distort. So, yeah, that person ignored me in the office. They put their head down. They stormed out the office. Well, hang on, in reality, thinking about it objectively, they put their head down, they just lowered the gaze and they walked out the office. I've given that thing meaning. I've distorted the event. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is what he's saying that we do. We ignore, forget, or discredit information. So our brain is really clever. At, and it makes sense to me now after reading that. Um, we respond to anything that changes our identity or our story about ourselves. We respond to it. It's difficult and painful. And we respond to it by our distorted thinking. That's quite, that's made sense to me now. So it's a defense mechanism. Our brain defends our flawed model of the world with an armory of crafty biases. The biases are what we're talking about. So the biases of, I mean, there's loads of different biases. Um, oh, what's the, the sunk cost fallacy that if you own, if you own something for a long period of time, um, it holds more value. So, for example, um, you you own a car for over 10 plus years. That car holds more value than what you probably think. You'll think the car's worth more than it actually is because of the sunk cost fallacy. I think I'm correct in saying that. Someone watching this now is going to um, discredit that on the on the comments. But, yeah, if it is wrong, tell me what the sunk cost fallacy is. I'm sure it's something along those lines that... I think James Smith, the uh, the PT, give an example of it being like, if you're married for 15 years, you find it harder. Even if you, you don't love each other anymore, you don't want to be with that person anymore, you will still find it hard to leave the individual because of so much time you've spent together. It's something along those lines, yeah? I might be talking shit, so don't take my word for it. Um, so these biases, we delete, we start, we generalise. When we come across any new fact or opinion, we immediately judge it. If it's consistent with our model of reality, our brains give a subconscious feeling of yes. If it's not, it gives a subconscious feeling of no. These emotional responses happen before we go through any process of conscious reasoning. They exert a powerful influence over us when deciding whether to believe something or not. Our sense of self is organised by an unreliable narrator. We're led to believe we're in complete control of ourselves, but we're not. We're led to believe we really know who we are, but we don't. We're just stories. And you know what the... Darren Brown said this in his book, Happy. The beautiful thing about the fact that we are just stories...
is that we can change it. We can change our story. Yeah, it's not easy. I get it. I get it. It's not easy. It takes work. But we can start to change our stories. When we understand... When you understand that your identity is built up of stories, of the language that you use, you can start to change your language, tell yourself a different story, and understand that what you experience in life is just a perception and it's not actual reality. And when you try and understand where someone else is coming from, through the model of the world. Yeah, and you can get like deep into it. Do you know what I mean? Like, you don't want to be listening to someone talk and trying to pick out oh, what kind of language are they, what kind of learning submodalities are they using? What, type, what kind of internal representational systems are they coming from? But just try and understand. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was in the police, we had to work at a place called um, Bassinborn. We got seconded to a place called Bassinborn. And cut a long story short, I had to share accommodation with a skipper from a different a different um a different part of the MOD police called the SEG. And I had to share a room with him. And I'd heard I won't name names and that, but I'd heard a few people say, Oh Jesus Christ, you're gonna struggle with him getting conversation out of him, or oh, he's a right miserable get him. And me being me, I thought, right, well, other people have said that. I'm going to I'm gonna make me form my own opinions of him. I'm not going to listen to other people's opinions of him when I've not even met him. That's not fair. And I went, I was probably just, I was probably just reading Stephen R. Covey's Seven Habits of Success, Successful People at this time, because this is why it sticks out to me as an example. One of the chapters in that book is understand before being understood. I said it before, understand someone else's model of the world before imparting your model of the world on them. Yeah. And that's what I did essentially with this guy. We got talking. People like talking about themselves inherently. You ask someone enough questions, they enjoy talking about themselves. So I was asking him questions about himself, about his life, about his family. And I don't know where these other people who who would take it piss out of him got the got their opinions from because he was a nice fella and it turns out he had a son with learning difficulties and when he was at work he was at work and he kept his family and personal life separate to his working life so he didn't really open up and talk to other people in groups he didn't really um, socialise in work kept himself to himself and he didn't really suffer fools. Once I tried to understand his model of the world and his perception of reality and where he was coming from, understand before being understood, it was it was an easy succumbent. It, it was sound, the guy was nice. Once I understood the boundaries and I got to know him a bit better, I understood where he was coming from. It was sorted. That's why it stands out as such an important example because and I've used that example a few times that I was reading that book and I was trying the techniques from the book basically and it was a perfect time to trial it because I got on pretty well with him once I understood and, un and accepted what his frame of reference was and he I'm not saying he did the same to me and he was trying to get to know me but I already had this barrier going into the the secondment that I'm going to be with this person. And all right, I didn't, I was going to form my own opinion, but there was already a, a barrier there, people thinking, oh, this guy's miserable and you're going to have a, a nightmare with him. But after asking him about his family, getting to know him, because long story short, I know that was a long um, waffle, but you got the point of the, the story. So that we're going to leave because I understand that we've been talking for quite a while and not even touched half of what I wanted to talk about. But I, I wanted to keep this under under really like 40 minutes because 
I hope after this you're going to go and read the book anyway. Um, so I'll we'll leave you with this. There was an experiment um, about your experiences at school and people, people said that maybe your school years aren't that important. They don't really affect the rest of your life. So this is contrary to that. And I'm not talking about exams and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about your experience of being at school. So the brain's model continues to form during adolescence. Our popularity or otherwise at school also warps our neural models and therefore our experience of reality forever. Our position on the social hierarchy during adolescence doesn't merely alter who we are as adults specifically. It changes our brain wiring and consequently it has changed what we see what we think and how we act. I'll say that again. Our position on the social hierarchy during adolescence doesn't merely alter who we are as adults, superficially. It changes our brain wiring and consequently, it changes what we see, what we think and how we act. So this was the uh, experiment. Researchers asked people to watch videos of scenes that were busy with social interactions, such as a film of a school corridor. They then tracked the saccades, which is eye movement, where their eyes flit to, dead quick movement. They tracked the saccades so they could see which elements the participants' brains were attending to. And what they found was those with past histories of social success in school, so those who were popular in school, spent most of their time looking at people being friendly, smiling, chatting and nodding. But those who had a high school experience of loneliness and being socially isolated scarcely looked at the positive scenes at all. Instead, they spent around 80% of their time looking at people being unfriendly and bullying, almost as if they were watching a completely different movie. Let's dig into that a little bit. So the experience at school, I remember being at Cowley and pff, I'm a bit indifferent to whether my experience at school was, it wasn't, I wasn't buzzing like, do you know what I mean? I wasn't buzzing at being at school, but I was at school, I got on with it. I enjoyed it to a certain degree, but I was never bullied or I would never have said that I was lonely at any point in that like, but it's interesting that if you was at the extreme ends, and I do think about people who were bullied at school, and I fucking can't stand bullying, and to think if this is true and there's no reason why it shouldn't be if studies were done, how that has affected their life. So those individuals who were socially isolated or lonely at school in their adolescence It's affected them because they're still now reframing stuff and their model of the world now when they look at things is to look and pinpoint whether that's subconsciously the unfriendliness or the bullying. That's crazy. So it just shows how it's a different model of the world. So if you've had that experience when you were younger, you now look at the world through a lens of that loneliness and that self-isolation. Whereas if you were quite popular, if you were popular, then you later on in life, you now look through the world through a lens, again, generalizing of a completely different mover. That's mad, isn't it? That's crazy how an event or an experience of being at school would affect you unseemingly for the rest of your life. So you think about like kids now with the online bullying and the social media platforms and all that kind of stuff. You, you wonder how that's going to affect people later on in life. Wow. So we'll end
I'll end on this little note at the end. Life is change that yearns for stability. So all life is change. We're currently doing a, a piece at the moment about managing change and it's the only constant in life, isn't it? Change is the only constant in life. And how well you handle that change will ultimately define how happy you are. And we all yearn to find some stability in that change. And I think if we can change our stories and we can understand that we don't need to make events fit our model of the world. Let's just understand events as they happen. And we can we can get around the fact of trying to make a narrative out of anything. If something happens, maybe it just happened. Yeah. There doesn't need to be a narrative. There doesn't need to be a reason why that happened. If cause and effect, it doesn't need to be that. It can just happen in isolation. And accept that. Just accept. Sometimes shit happens. Anyway. I hope you've got something out of this. I hope I um, maybe made you think about a few points. Certainly helped me think and maybe um, allow me to process a few more things a bit better. So The Science of Storytelling by Will Storgalt and by Have a read. There's much more to the book than what I've gone through already. He does a cracking thing at the end where he, one of my favourite films is The Godfather. Um, and he talks about one of the scenes in The Godfather and breaks it down into these five acts. Sorry, he talks about The Godfather as a whole and breaks it down into these five acts and where the hero's journey comes in. And that's fantastic. That's worth the price alone for the book. To understand it on a deeper level. Fascinating. But anyway, take it easy. I've enjoyed my coffee. The future. Quality street hazelnut latte. See you later, peeps. Take care.